Welcome to the Know Your Records program. My name is Erin Townsend, and I'm the program coordinator. We are so happy you've joined us. The Know Your Records program provides information on how to access and conduct research using U.S. federal government records held at the National Archives. We have over 100 educational videos on how to conduct research available online. We invite you to join the conversation. During the video's premiere, you can participate with the presenters and other audience members via live chat. Ask questions and get the presenters answers anytime throughout the video and for an additional 10 minutes after the presentation ends. Here's how to engage in the live chat. You can ask questions via chat by first logging into YouTube. Continue to watch the chat because the speaker will answer your questions there. Type your questions at any time throughout the presentation. Please keep your questions on today's topic. Our presentation today is titled Researching Court Martial Records at the National Archives at St. Louis. Courts martial are trials convened to try members of the armed forces or other countries prisoners of war. Records of these trials can cover cases ranging from petty theft to conscientious objection to murder. Our presenters will give a history of court martial records, examples of record content found at the National Archives at St. Louis, and step-by-step -step guidance on requesting these publicly available records. We have two presenters joining us today, Kayla Dawkins and Katherine Terry. Kayla is a reference archive specialist for the National Archives at St. Louis, where she has been employed for eight years. She has a Bachelor of Arts in English Language and Literature from Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, as well as a Master of Library and in Information Science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Kat is an archives technician with the National Archives at St. Louis. Starting at the National Archives in 2015, Kat joined Archival Reference in 2020. Her current work involves providing access to the individual personnel records for civilian employees of the federal government and former military. She holds a bachelor's degree from Southern Illinois University Carbondale in political science with a specialization in international affairs and a minor in museum studies. Welcome Kayla and Kat. Thank you for your presentation today. Thank you for your time and attention today. I'm Kayla. I'm Kat. And before we dig into the content of our presentation, we'd like to offer a quick note of advisory on the content of this record series. Court martial records contain some content that may be harmful or difficult to view. NARA's records span the history of the United States and is our charge to preserve and make available these historical records. As a result, some of the materials relate to violent or graphic events and are preserved for their historical significance. Please conduct your research with care and mindfulness needed to review this kind of content. And now, on with the presentation. I'll begin briefly with the origins of courts martial in the United States, which trace back to April 1775, when the Provisional Congress of Massachusetts Bay adopted, with little change, the 1774 British Articles of War. This created the first written military code for American forces known as the Massachusetts Articles of War. This code established two types of military courts, general, which dealt with more serious offenses, and regimental, reserved for lesser charges against non-commissioned officers. As you can tell, the court martial is older than even the US Constitution. In the time since then, there have been endless numbers of stories told in these courts, some famous or infamous. One of those famous defendants is pictured here, not known for the circumstances of his trial, but for his writing career. Edgar Allan Poe's record of court martial can be found at the National Archives at Washington, DC. From 1831, this record is too old to be a part of our holdings in St. Louis. Locations of these and other court martial records of trial that we don't have at our facility can be found in the handout linked in the description bar. Before we move on, let's talk about where we are now. Starting in 2013, 
the National Archives at St. Louis became the home for many Army, Navy, and Marine Corps court-martial records. We are the primary repository for most military and civilian federal service records, so this was the natural final destination for such documentation. These records are invaluable for so many reasons, including supplementing information lost in the 1973 fire at the National Personnel Records Center, when approximately 16 to 18 million military personnel files were destroyed. There are three standard types of court martial record. They include summary, special, and general. They differ in the trial procedures and in the severity of possible punishments. Summary court martial cases are used to resolve minor offenses. They are composed of a streamlined trial with a single officer presiding over the hearing. The officer functions as prosecutor, defense counsel, judge, and jury. A conviction of summary court martial is not treated as a criminal conviction by civilian jurisdictions. The highest form of punishment for a summary court martial is 30 days confinement, a reduction in rank, and or a forfeiture of a fraction of pay for a month. Summary court martials don't produce large trial transcripts or exhibits. Unlike special or general court martial records, they are not scheduled as a series separate from the official military personnel file, or OMPF. So, materials regarding these charges that remain in an official military personnel file are the only records maintained regarding this kind of court martial. Because of this, our presentation will primarily focus on special and general court martial records. Special court martial proceedings are equivalent to a misdemeanor in state court conviction. These cases include crimes such as petty theft, possession of drugs or controlled substances, vandalism, intoxication, etc. A guilty verdict could result in punishments such as a bad conduct discharge and one year of confinement. Most special court martial records that did not result and a bad conduct discharge are not considered permanent records and are therefore not included in our holdings. General court martial trial is the highest level of trial court. Charges related to general court martial cases are equivalent to felony cases in federal district court or state criminal court. Charges are brought by an officer or convening authority, which serves as the prosecution. Charges are prosecuted by a judge advocate or trial counsel, which serve as defense. General court martial trials consist of five jurors, 12 if the death penalty is a mandatory sentence for the alleged crime. General court martial records cover cases of the highest offenses, which include murder, sexual assault, and threat to national security. Due to the sometimes heinous nature of these crimes, the punishments recommended for those being tried by general court martial could include life in confinement, forfeiture of all pay and allowances, dishonorable discharge or bad conduct discharge, dismissal from the service, or even the death penalty. Defendants facing general or special court martial are represented by appointed judge advocates acting as defense counsel at no charge to the defendant. However, just as in civil court, defendants may also be represented at general or special court martial by civilian attorneys hired at their own expense. Finally, though not mentioned on the slide, I'd like to touch briefly on the methods by which a verdict is reached. The members of the jury vote by secret written ballot on each of the allegations the accused person faces. Unlike most civilian jurisdictions, a unanimous verdict is not required in most cases. Unless the death penalty is mandatory for the offense in question, the members may convict by a two-thirds majority. If the death penalty is mandatory if convicted, the members must be unanimous in their verdict. Appeals may be filed with a military court as appropriate. Each court-martial is assigned a case number. You may also see these called court-martial numbers. These terms are interchangeable, even in the records themselves. All of the services records of trial are filed sequentially in a single index by case number. One, two, three, four, and so forth. Of course, in most instances, our requesters will not know the case number and there is not an electronic registry of courts martial. Rather, individual index cards were created for each defendant. They have not yet been digitized as of this recording. 
In filing cabinets, we keep on site in St. Louis. These index cards are arranged by service and then alphabetically by last name. For the Navy and Marine Corps, they are further divided by year of trial. These cards provide information that can help our search staff confirm that the person whose file they're seeking is the person whose card they're holding, the service number, unit, trial dates, and so forth. You can see here several examples of the cards the different services kept through the years. As you can tell, the cards differ drastically, not only from service branch to service branch, but also from year to year. When researching these records, it is crucial to remember that court martial files are indexed by the defendant's last name. To locate a file, you must have, at minimum, the court martial case number or the defendant's last name. Navy and Marine Corps records also require a year or a limited possible time frame for a search to be conducted. Without this information, it is impossible to search for a specific record. One final note of interest, if you seek a record in which multiple defendants were tried in a single trial, you do not need to know the names of everyone. Cards were created for each individual, and we should be able to locate what you need, even if you only know of a single defendant. Kara? Thanks, Kat. Next, I'd like to introduce the types of court martial records at NARA at St. Louis. The Army Air Force general and special court martial records are broken into two separate series based on the year of trial. The first run covers general and special court martial records for the years 1917 to 1938. The second run of Army Air Force court martial records covers the years of trial from 1939 to 1976. The series includes all general court martial proceedings and only special court martial proceedings which resulted in the veteran receiving a bad conduct discharge. And finally, the National Archives at St. Louis has Navy and Marine Corps general and special court martial records for the years 1951 through 1976. More information about where to locate additional years of trial can be found in the presentation handout. Now let's dive further into detail on each of these series. I'll begin with the first series of Army Air Force General and Special Court Martial Records. They cover the years of trial from 1917 to 1938. This collection contains all Army Air Force Court Martial Records from this time period, regardless of the outcome of the trial or the resulting punishments. You may search the catalog for this series using the National Archives identifier listed on this slide, though only a few records of trial have been digitized and uploaded at the time of this recording. These records were created to document trials by general court martial, military commissions, and courts of inquiry. They originate at the various court martial jurisdictions in the continental United States and at overseas commands and were forwarded to the judge advocate general as prescribed by the record schedule. The contents of general and special court martial records are fairly standard. This Army Air Force court martial record series serves as a good example of those standards. So let's discuss the typical contents of a court martial now. A typical court martial record includes documents describing the organization and personnel of the courts. A list of charges, pleas, and arraignments of defendants are also included. You will find witness statements and exhibits submitted for consideration by the court. Among the witness statements and exhibits is usually the place in which you will find oddities, pieces of human interest, and some sensitive information. Finally, standard court martial records include a transcript of the proceedings, findings of the court, and sentencing information. This includes findings associated with appeals cases as well. They include reports of the reviewing authorities, statements of action, and some miscellaneous correspondence. The second series of the Army, Air Force, General and Special Court Martial records of trial covered trials from the period 1939 to 1976. This series includes all general court martial records from this time period, but the special court martial records in this series include only the proceedings which resulted in a guilty verdict with the punishment of a bad conduct discharge. 
Special court martials that did not result in a bad conduct discharge were destroyed in accordance with federal regulations. You may search the catalog for this series using the National Archives identifier listed on this slide, though only a few records of trial have been digitized and uploaded at the time of this recording. To the right, you'll see an example of the standard cover sheet for an Army Air Force court martial record of trial, and next to it, a not so standard example of an exhibit. As mentioned in the last slide, exhibits are elements of the court martial records which can be unpredictable. This Valentine card was submitted into evidence as a part of the trial proceedings. It is a Valentine addressed to the veteran from his murder victim. The veteran was convicted of his crime and later sentenced to death. While we're talking about guilty verdicts, it seems appropriate to bring up the point of appeals. This isn't listed on the slide, but it's worthwhile to mention. Guilty verdicts may be contested through the Military Court of Appeals to review the proceedings and ensure they were fair and that the proper laws were applied correctly. The appeals proceedings and results are typically included in the original court-martial record unless otherwise specified under a new court-martial number. These appeals cases may result in a reduction in the severity of the sentence, the complete dismissal of charges, and or a change in the character of discharge. You might be thinking, but Kayla, you mentioned that special court martial records in the series are only those that resulted in bad conduct discharge. What if you know of a case that originally resulted in a bad conduct discharge, but the character of discharge was later upgraded? Would you still have that court martial? The answer is the dreaded, it depends. In some cases, the original record of trial may still exist. For example, if the case was appealed, and the changes to the character of discharge were applied after the date in which the records were transferred to the custody of the National Archives, a record may still exist. We know that these caveats can be confusing, but our team is here to help you navigate these tricky cases. Please reach out to our team with questions using the contact information on these slides and or the presentation handout. The Navy and Marine Corps General Courts Martial and Special Courts Martial resulting in bad conduct discharge span from 1951 to 1976 and mirror those of the Army. Just like their Army counterparts, these records include detailed documentation of charges, the proceedings of the courts, witness testimonies, and final sentencing. For researchers, they can offer insights into the military environment and societal norms of the time. One example of a Marine Corps special court-martial is pictured here. Baldemar Huerta, later known as Tejano music star Freddie Fender, did not commit a grave offense such as that which would warrant a general court-martial trial. Instead, he was sentenced to bad conduct discharge, forfeiture of $30 per month for six months, and confinement at hard labor for five months for, quote, willful disobedience of a superior officer and the use of disrespectful language toward the same officer. The disobedience in question? He was ordered to prepare salad while on duty and said he would make them when he got ready. Once he commenced making salad, he was wearing a cook's khakis rather than his rank's uniform. As we mentioned previously, when requesting these records, knowing the year can be crucial in narrowing down our search. If you do not have a year of trial, or at least a rough time frame between two or five years or so, knowing the location of the trial and or unit in which the defendant served can be crucial in helping us figure out the time frame ourselves. Now, let's delve a little bit more into the series of records missing from these slides. All special courts martial case files from this time frame that did not result in a bad conduct discharge, summary courts martial records, and Navy and Marine Corps deck courts martials were destroyed in accordance with life cycle regulations. It is extremely rare that you'll find any documentation of these types of Army or Air Force trials due to the extraordinary loss of the OMPFs in the aforementioned fire, but Navy and Marine Corps records are intact. 
The Marine Corps OMPF for Dave Lawson pictured here is a fantastic example of the types of details available to the public if A, the veteran still has an original personnel record that was not involved in the NPRC fire, and B, the veteran was discharged from service over 62 years prior. You'll see this service book is not an official record of the trial. It does include important details such as dates of trials, charges, and sentences. If you want to find this existing information about the special and summary courts martial that we no longer have records of trial for, there will be more information on ordering archival records at the end of our presentation. In the meantime, Kayla and I will share some examples of the variety of records you can find in the court martial records of trial. The Battle of Bamber Bridge is a lesser known but significant event that highlights racial tensions present in the U.S. military during World War II. This incident took place on June 24 and 25, 1943, in the village of Bamber Bridge in England. Bamber Bridge, unlike many parts of the United States at the time, was relatively progressive in its attitude towards race relations. The British locals welcomed the Black soldiers from the segregated 1,511th Quartermaster Truck Regiment in stark contrast to the attitudes that these soldiers often faced even within their own military units. The conflict began when Army Private Eugene Nunn, a Black soldier, was stopped by two white American military police officers for not wearing the proper uniform. The situation quickly escalated when other Black soldiers and white British civilians sided with none against the military police, who then left to gather reinforcements. Later that evening, the military police officers returned and a violent clash erupted that lasted into the next day. Over 400 rounds of ammunition were fired and Private William Crossland was killed. The trials that followed seemed to place the blame for the incident squarely on the black soldiers. Pictured to the right is a portion of the map of Bamber Bridge used as a trial exhibit, digitized in parts due to its large size and then pieced back together here. Furthering the illustration of racial tensions in the United States is the example of the Army General Court Martial record of baseball legend Jackie Robinson. Brooklyn Dodgers number 42, Jackie Robinson, was the first Black American to play in Major League Baseball in the modern era. In July of 1944, Robinson was awaiting results of hospital tests on an ankle he had injured in junior college. He boarded an Army bus with a fellow officer's wife. Once aboard the bus, the driver ordered Robinson to move to the back. However, Robinson refused. The driver backed down, but after reaching the end of the bus line, he summoned the military police, who took Robinson into custody. When Robinson later confronted the investigating duty officer about the racist questioning from him and his assistant, the officer recommended Robinson be court-martialed. After Robinson's commanding officer refused to authorize the legal action, Robinson was transferred to the 758th Battalion, where the commander of that unit quickly consented to charge Robinson with multiple offenses, including, among other charges, public drunkenness, even though Robinson did not drink. By the time of the court-martial in August of 1944, the charges against Robinson had been reduced to two counts of insubordination during questioning, further detailed in the transcript of the trial. Robinson was eventually acquitted by an all-white panel of nine officers. Although his former unit, the 761st Tank Battalion, became the first black tank unit to see combat in World War II, Robinson's court-martial proceedings prohibited him from being deployed overseas, and he was never in combat. After his acquittal, he was transferred to Camp Breckenridge, Kentucky, where he served as a coach for Army athletics until receiving an honorable discharge in 1944. Robinson's general court-martial record is digitized and available on NARA's catalog. The National Archives identifier is linked on this slide under 
Robinson's official statement regarding the events of the day on the left side of the slide. The documents of the right side of the slide include the specified charges, which include behaving with disrespect toward a superior officer and willful disobedience of lawful command. Finally, if you're interested in further information regarding Jackie Robinson's military career, his official military personnel file is also available digitally on the catalog. The National Archives identifier can be found in the last paragraph at the bottom of the slide as a hyperlink. Something you'll find many examples of in our court's martial records are conscientious objectors. Those who refuse to participate in the military or bear arms due to their religious, moral, or ethical views. Army Private Harold E. Bruber was charged in January 1918 with desertion. He pleaded not guilty on grounds of being a conscientious objector due to his religious beliefs. After a brief trial, Private Bruber was found guilty and sentenced to, quote, be dishonorably discharged the service, to forfeit all pay and allowances due or to become due, and to be confined at hard labor at such a place as the reviewing authority may direct for 15 years. He would not end up serving his full sentence. Shortly after his imprisonment began, his time was reduced to 10 years by the Judge Advocate General's Office due to his impressive sincerity of belief. In August 1919, a Board of Inquiry ordered that Private Brewer and several other conscientious objectors be released. The portion of the trial transcript included on this slide to the left contains some of the type of questioning the prosecution had regarding his religious beliefs. The mugshot taken of him during his time at Leavenworth Penitentiary and other inmate case files can be found on the other side of our state at the National Archives at Kansas City. Black women joined the Women's Army Corps, or WAC for short, in segregated army units between 1942 and 1945, making up about 4% of the total force. The WAC advertised specialized training and career opportunities for women that would challenge them and prepare them for work after the war's end. Black members of the Women's Army Corps, however, were limited to menial duties as janitors, laundresses, or dishwashers. Many of them had unfairly been denied well-paying defense jobs despite President Franklin D. Roosevelt's 1941 executive order banning discrimination in war work. On March 9, 1945, the WAC unit at Fort Devens in Massachusetts staged a walkout in protest of this discrimination. Their commanding officers threatened them with court-martial or insubordination. Fifty of them decided to return to work, but four others, Privates Anna Morrison, Mary Green, Alice Young, and Johnny Murphy refused. They were tried by court martial on March 19, 1945, and all were found guilty of insubordination, a quote, grave military offense, according to Major General Sherman Miles, the accuser and the prosecutor in the case. Two letters from Major General Sherman Miles are pictured to the right. One is the letter that was issued as a letter of orders to the unit threatening court-martial charges if they failed to comply. It was used as an exhibit in the trial. The other is a letter written to the Judge Advocate General of the Army after the trial with a bit of a change of tone, declaring the verdict null and void. Their story made national news and family, friends, and strangers rallied to the women's defense. Thurgood Marshall, the lead attorney for the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund, announced that he would take on their appeal. Anxious to calm the storm, the Judge Advocate General of the Army decided to dismiss the charges against the women and revoke their sentences. Though they returned to duty at Fort Devens, military authorities did not resolve the overall problems of job discrimination against Black service women. This slide includes the official letter revoking the charges and sentence for Alice Young and a letter of support for the women written to the Judge Advocate General by a book club. We have one final example to share with you today, and there's nothing quite like an espionage case to highlight the importance of providing as much identifying information as possible when you submit a request for a court martial record. 
If you know the subject of your request may have used multiple names throughout their life, this is vital information to include in your request. Or if you're submitting a request for a female, please always include both married and maiden names. Now, onto the story of a German spy, but please bear with me through the pronunciation of the names in this example. Lothar Witzke, also known as Pablo Babersky, was a German officer who became a spy for the secret service system of the Imperial German government during World War I. Witzke's story is layered with so many deceptions, covert operations, and complex characters that I can only scratch the surface of his story here today. Witzke's life of espionage began when his German naval warship was caught and sunk, and as a result, he was captured and held in a prison in Chile but he quickly managed to escape in 1916. Under an assumed name, he succeeded in reaching the United States, where he contacted the German Consul General. The officials at the German consulate recognized his special skills, his prowess, and his cleverness in evading authorities. Because of this, they put him in touch with a leading German spy and ex-Marine based in Mexico, Kurt Janka. Yanka and Witzke became leaders of the German espionage network in Mexico. Together, they plotted several munitions plant explosions, though questions remain as to how many were their direct responsibility, and they fomented labor strikes in the U.S. Their basic assignment was to sow discord and unrest. Eventually, Witzke was arrested at the Arizona-Mexico border. However, upon capture, he claimed to be a Russian citizen who went by the name Pablo Babersky. On this slide, you can see two forms of identification, one from the Russian consulate in Mexico claiming his identification as Pablo Babersky, and the other from the American consulate also listing his identification as Pablo Babersky. However, when he was captured at the border, a cryptogram was found sewn into the sleeve of his jacket, and several months later, this cryptogram was broken to reveal his identity as a sworn member of the Secret Service System of the Imperial German Government. You can see a copy of the cryptogram that was included as an exhibit for the case on this slide, as well as an image used to aid in the true identification of Vitska. Vitska was convicted by a military court at Fort Sam Houston for espionage, and for this crime, he was sentenced to death. President Woodrow Wilson eventually commuted Vitska's death sentence to life imprisonment. Ultimately, he was released with the armistice of November 11, 1918, and deported back to Berlin. The letter on the left side of the slide outlines his conviction and his sentencing to be hanged. The image to the right bears Woodrow Wilson's signature commuting his sentence. If you're interested in obtaining copies of our court martial records, our staff will happily assist you. When making a request, be sure to include as much detail as possible, such as the defendant's name, branch of service, and date of trial. Fees for copies are based on the size of the record when measured by the half inch. NARA does not receive appropriated funds from Congress for responding to requests for photocopies of archival records, so we are required to collect fees from our requesters and exempt from the fee waiver provisions in the Freedom of Information Act. Or FOIA. Due to our move to digital invoicing and away from paper checks and money orders, email addresses are required for every off-site request. Requests for digital scans of records can be sent via email to stl.archives at nara.gov or postal mail to the address shown. For those planning to visit our research room in St. Louis, Missouri, appointments are required and can be made via email to stlarr.archives at nara.gov or through our Eventbrite page. Our hours of operation are Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., with closures on weekends and federal holidays. Scheduling an appointment allows our staff to prepare the records you need ensuring your visit is as productive as possible. This is especially important if you need large quantities of records for some kind of special project. If visiting our location is not possible, we also suggest consulting independent researchers for hire in the area. For more information on this option, visit archives.gov research slash hire help. 
This concludes our prepared presentation. We appreciate everyone for spending your time with us today. Kayla and I will be available to chat immediately following this presentation. We're happy to answer any questions related to the court's martial records of trial available at the National Archives at St. Louis, and we hope that we can help make your research as successful as possible. If you're watching the recorded video after the premiere date, you can direct your questions to St. Louis staff at stl.archives at nara.gov or to the Know Your Records program at inquire at nara.gov. Thank you. Thank you again for watching. This ends the lecture portion of the broadcast, but we will continue to take your questions about today's topic in the chat. If we do not get to your question, please send us an email at inquire at nara.gov. Note that the videos and handouts will remain available on this YouTube page and our website. We plan future programs based on your feedback. Would you please take a minute to complete our short online evaluation form. Although this concludes the video portion of the broadcast, we will continue to take your questions in the chat for another 10 minutes. Please stay if you have questions. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation.